were writing. Uh, one of the great things about this film is that it's not an ideological film. It's not a film about sexual identity. It's very open, it's very exploratory, but it's important to remember the political context in which it uh, emerged in the early 1970s. This is before Anita Bryant. Uh, this is before the sex panics of the late 1970s, for example, that saw the body politic, the Toronto Gay Live newspaper hauled into court for having published an article in 1977, Men Loving Boys Loving Men. So it's in a certain way an age of innocence before the boom was lowered, before the panics set in, and a certain kind of embargo on discourses and imagery around child sexuality, around intergenerational sexuality, uh, was imposed that lasted uh, a couple of decades, and from which I think we're only now beginning to uh, emerge. Uh, another very interesting film from the Stelier, that's uh, Bozo Moyle on the left, and uh, Frank Vitale in the center, He's still very hot, I think, but... <laughs> <laughs> and Stephen Lack on the right, and they're in front of the setting uh, Frit Doré for, for several of the scenes that you just saw uh, took place. If you get the DVD, you'll find this little documentary tour of the main uh, circuit of 2008, very, very interesting. Uh, so, for example, another very interesting film of the 1970s, Rosa von Kraunheim's Army of Lovers, Revolt of the Perverts, uh, includes a whole spectrum of factions within the gay American gay movements, including an interview with Tom Reeves, who headed a uh, Boston Boys uh, Committee uh, and was one of the founders of the North American Boy Love Association. Uh, 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 his interview is a kind of manifesto of politics around intergenerational sexuality, around child sexuality. And so much of this uh, political discourse uh, is, has been disavowed uh, in the subsequent decades by the mainstream uh, gay movement. So this film, I think, is a very interesting document of a kind of uh, uh, era when the revolutionary fervor was very much still in the air of the sexual revolution, of the gay revolution, uh, uh, before a certain mainstreaming uh, occurred. Um, the gay body, the, sorry, the body politic critic of 1974 recognized, I think, the politics, the implicit politics, because it's certainly not explicit in the film, uh, Ron Damon recognized, quote, the overwhelming message of the denial of the rights of children is one of the most powerful aspects of the film. Johnny is continually oppressed by the adult world, and uh, parenthetically I think it's very important that the last image of the film is of Johnny, and it ends up being a film really much, very much about Johnny's agency. Uh, continuing, quote, uh, he's continually oppressed by the adult world, by his pseudo-hip parents, who are obviously paranoid about their son's friendship, quote-unquote, and eventually by Frank, who easily cedes to conventional morality through fear. John is trapped in an ageist, homophobic world where freedom is impossible. And according to Damon, one of the features of the film, its achievements, is, quote, the sensual, though latent, character of their relationship comes across beautifully. So there was some recognition at the time of the importance of this film, of the achievement of this film, before it uh, lapsed into obscurity. So I wanted to make those contextual comments uh, uh, before we open up to questions and comments. This was not the only film of the 70s that dealt with children's uh, sexuality, with intergenerational sexuality. You may be familiar with um, Louis Mal's uh, Murmur of the Heart or uh, his Pretty Baby at the end of the decade that also deal with intergenerational heterosexual uh, sexuality. 
Uh, you may also be familiar with uh, Lucino Visconti's um, landmark 1971 film, Death in Venice. So this handful of very brave and iconic films from the 70s are important to remember, uh, uh, especially in the context of uh, what you might call the silence that followed. Uh, okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to say, and I would love to hear uh, your comments and questions. Was there, um, I didn't catch anywhere in the film that anyone had sex. Was it implied in the story that you just didn't see it? Or? Well, Frank and Bozo started in the day, but the, <laughs> then the dogs and the sirens started. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yes. There's no explicit sexuality in the film. It's very open, it's very ambiguous. Um, um, it's, that's not what the film's about, I don't think. Yes? I, I would say specifically that isn't what the film's about in the sense that, uh, and I see a difference between the man... Can like everyone hear? Mm -hmm. Shout a bit. Okay. Shout. Uh, that there's a difference, but uh, I, I think it's a, a, an important distinction that there isn't, I don't think there is a, um, necessarily sexual acts in the film between Johnny and others. And that there's a distinct difference between man loving boys loving men or Nambla and the um, the sexuality of a child, which is uh, a nascent understanding of who they are, which is what is portrayed beautifully here. And a heterosexual context is portrayed very beautifully in the film. Um, I think it's called Beautiful Girls with Timothy Hutton and uh, uh, what's her name, Natalie Portman. Um, and I think it's an important distinction that there is. There is such a thing, of course, as a child sexuality, which must be um, uh, appreciated and respected, but that it is a, it may be separate from uh, an adult, and usually is separate from adult sexuality uh, and an adult's way of expressing sexuality and sexual attraction. Uh, uh, Dylan, can I have a few more lights in the house, please? Who else? Comment or question? Yes. When is the DVD coming out and who did the music? Like, who was some of the songs you're great to hear? So. Uh, the music, uh, I don't know her work, but she was a local folkish uh, rock singer on the Montreal scene in the 70s, and she did original music for the film. And the DVD's coming out um, later this year, and I, I can't tell you the name of the US distributor. Here in Canada, I believe my colleague is handling the distribution. Uh, what I would suggest is in a month or two, uh, Google it and see what you come up with, and then if you uh, come up there, just uh, email me at Concordia. Yes, I, I wonder, Aaron. I, I wonder if you could uh, comment on some of the reasons you think the, the various moral panics uh, Set in and why, why this discourse was uh, was silenced or or changed. I mean, one of the first thing that occurs to me is with with a feminist analysis of intergenerational uh, sex, which is very very different. Uh, but anyway, just interested in your take on why everything shifted. Uh, I'd like to hear yours as well, uh, as well, but maybe. To start things off, I think that as a kind of feminist consensus emerged in the late 70s around uh, uh, at least the right wing of the feminist movement around pornography and um, uh, uh, rape and abuse, um, there was a new political constellation forming as well. and. Uh, coalitions between the women's movement and the new evangelical right in the U.S. especially, but also in Canada, uh, began to have an impact. Uh, and I think for this coalition, uh, child sexuality and fear about child sexuality and intergenerational sexuality became a very, very useful plank for this coalition. And you saw it happen in 1977 in Miami with Anita Bryant, 